possible yeah. and it's oh it's recording just started yeah, yeah. so at this rate our technology has been used for many different applications from mapping the floods and biomass to geohazards you know improving the safety of the maritime earthquakes and many many other applications and it's just uh, picking up every day and more and more new applications coming up just because um, more and more data are becoming available from many civil satellites, but also commercial satellites. So here I show you some of the satellites that are actually mostly civil. So meaning that operated by the, the space agencies and their purpose was to uh, provide data that is used by uh, almost everybody. Um, so the oldest one is the ERS satellite, as you can see it here. Um, so the ERS satellite, as you can see it here, launched in 1992, which was um, the, a pioneering satellite. Also the technology was very simplistic, but it opened the pass, uh, opened the way uh, for uh, implementation of the radar satellites for uh, many different applications. And, uh, and then uh, in recent years, we have uh, many new satellites launched. I wanna emphasize this one here, Sentinel-1AB, which is operating in C-band um, uh, frequency, uh, launched by European Space Agency. It, it become a game changer because from the beginning that it was launched, they, they adopted uh, open data policy. So any data that is acquired by the satellite is freely available to everybody within a few hours after the acquisition. So that's, that changed really the, the way radar technology was used for civil application because data was available. Many innovative applications emerged and, uh, and that's, that was actually, um, uh, motivation for many private companies that now are in this space and uh, operating and collecting, providing data at the very low cost, some of that actually for free. And also, uh, hopefully, we're going to have a NISAR mission, which is the NASA India SAR mission, uh, planned to be launched sometime this year, next year. Um, and this is also going to adopt the same policy as Sentinel 1, meaning data will be publicly available. And we expect that that would be a huge shift in the way that um, uh, radar uh, was used for um, geohazards uh, application. And as I mentioned, yeah. as I mentioned also, there are private sectors in this space. So one of those private um, company is um, ISI that operates a fleet of um, CubeSats or small sats that's collect data from anywhere on the earth and um, almost every couple of hours. So, and that has changed the applicability of earth observation uh, from um, uh, post event to rapid response. So for example, when we have a flood in some places, uh, just a few hours after the, the events, uh, satellite can fly over and create the uh, first um, damage and also flood extent map. Uh, which is often is impossible to create using optical imaging just because area is often covered by cloud. So if the hurricane goes through for days, the sky is um, covered by cloud and um, uh, there is no visibility for the optical imaging, but radar can penetrate through the cloud and see the ground like there is no cloud. So the first application of the the, the INSAR or SAR interferometry for geophysical application goes back to this paper, which is uh, almost three decades old, made it to the nature of the cover of the Nature magazine. Is the vertical deformation, surface deformation due to the Landers earthquake measured by the ERS um, satellite? Um, in the next few slides, just to make sure everybody's on the same page and we can follow um, how INSAR works, I have a few animations that show you. Uh, the basics of the INSAR. So think about this, Hawaii Island has two major volcanic uh, volcanoes, Mauna Loa and Kilauea, which are very active. And the satellite flies over the region, transmit the radar signal and collect the backscatter and create one image. No satellite goes away and come back sometimes later and transmit the same signal at location, which is slightly different from the first one and create the second image. So 
if we multiply the first image with the complex conjugate of the second one, we create an interferogram. What you see here is, um, maybe it's very hard to see, but there are fringes there that shows um, change in a, a distance from the satellite to the, to the observation point. And the majority of that contribution come from the surface deformation, but also surface topography. So we are interested in the surface deformation. We use a digital elevation model like SRTM dem which is publicly available. We subtract it from the interferogram and we create a differential interferogram. What you see here is the phase changes. For example, this is the Manolo and this is Kilawa here. Phase changes in the line of sight of the satellite. And um, majority of these phase changes due to the motion of the ground, but also we have some contribution from the other artifacts and errors, such as this one that you see here, um, uh, the signal that cannot be associated with any geophysical application. And we believe that's atmospheric artifact. So this, this was already a revolutionary technology, uh, imaging technology, beginning of 90s. And as uh, I mentioned, made it to the cover of the Nature magazine after the lander's earthquake. So next big thing happened almost uh, five, six years later, and that was uh, invention of the time series approaches. So this is a paper, is a landmark paper, permanent scattering in solar interferometry by Alessandro Fretti and um, others. So they used a repeated, repeated observation over the same area to combine them together, increase the redundancy in time and space, and create a time series of the surface deformation for each star pixel. So as a result of that combination, uh, they were also able to reduce the atmospheric artifacts and some of the environmental errors and create a very high precision map of the surface deformation. So we have two class of um, in-star time series technique. So one of them is a small baseline subset and the other one is the permanent scatter technique technique. So in this map, you see, what you see is that each dot, each circle is um, one image, one star image, and the red lines are the interferograms, similar to the animation that I'll show you. Each of them is created by combining two images. And we, since we have many acquisitions, we can combine them together and create such a network. So this is a network com configuration for the small baseline subset that it doesn't have any particular emphasis on any image any particular SAR acquisition, while to the one in the right side is the uh, image uh, the, the, or uh, baseline configuration for the technique called permanent or persistent scatterer. In this technique, all the interferograms are created with respect to one single image. As you can see here, this is the middle one. So there are some technical details associated with each of them. I don't go into detail of it, but just as a, uh, a general note, a small baseline technique is suitable for dealing with so-called distributed scatters. So this is a, a cell footprint of the one SAR um, pixel on the ground. And these triangles are the back scatter. Anything that returned the signal could be a building, could be a rock, could be a car, et cetera, et cetera. While the permanent scatter works with the, um, um, Persistent scatterers. The scatterers are those. The, those are uh, the persistent scatterers are those that have one dominant object that return most of the signal, like a you know roof of a building that is like a warehouse, and they have different applications, um, or they, they are applicable to different terrain, depending on um, uh, which of these scatterers is available. And I, I would stop here, but if anybody would be interested in learning more um, about the difference between technical, I would be available after my presentation. I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk to you, uh, tell you about that. In my lab, we developed a method, which is a multi-temporal, uh, multi-baseline technique from the small baseline uh, subset family. So we call it wavelet based. In this technique, we rely heavily on the wavelet theory um, to uh, identify and uh, remove environmental artifacts. So think about the stack of SAR images on the left, which is in the range and azimuth, which is the dimension of the radar, which is different than geographic reference frame. And the time, 
We send this stack into the 3D wavelets and we decompose it into its building blocks. And then we apply some statistical tests and analysis to identify, for example, atmospheric error, phase noise, orbital error, et cetera, et cetera, and remove them. And then we uh, perform inverse wavelet uh, transform. And through that, we can retrieve uh, surface deformation at high precision and accuracy. So I will carry on with some application of these tools and methods. So, So two applications that I would discuss, one of them would be relative sea level rise, and the second one would be in this seismicity, where I'm going to use this high precision observation of the surface deformation combined with other models and um, auxiliary information to learn something about the processes behind. So beginning with the relative sea level rise. So everybody knows sea levels are rising for a number of reasons. You know, uh, discharge of the uh, surface uh, terrestrial water, melting of the glaciers, expansion of the ocean um, due to the warming, change in the uh, direction of the wind, et cetera, et cetera. But also we know that the land is subsiding. So, and as the land subsides, the relative distance between the land surface and uh, water surface changes. And that's what we call relative sea level rise, which is an extremely important parameter. In fact, Relative sea level rise is what people care when they live near the coast, not the sea level rise itself per se. To highlight the importance of the relative sea level rise, I have this uh, uh, simple graph here. So there is a recent study that suggests um, uh, frequency of the flooding would increase along the US coast uh, by factor of two if you have just 10 to 20 centimeter rise in the sea level. So to the right, I show you the graph associated with the Galveston tide gate, which is in the Texas, south of uh, Houston. So the yellow line uh, shows the projection of the sea level rise at the Galveston tide gate. So as you can see, we hit that 20 centimeter threshold sometimes in 2040, 2045. But Knowing that tide gauge is subsiding, and we know that it's subsided at a rate of about three millimeter per year, that threshold is going to hit in almost five years, almost three years from now. So it means that we have nearly 15 years less time to prepare for the adverse impact of the sea level rise and flooding. So this highlights the importance of the land subsidence and uh, relative sea level rise in assessing the coastal hazards to the communities and ecosystems. So there are different processes drive the coastal uh, land substance in general. So here I show you the cross section through the North America goes from the west coast of the United States to the east coast. So and different processes are driving the movement of the land in vertical direction at different locations. So on the west coast, the main process is the tectonic. You know we have Cascadia subduction zone that. Um, um, in the current time, which is the interseismic period, which is the top one, panel A, um, due to the um, uh, compression of the overriding plate, it's uplifting. So at the moment, Cascadia, which is mostly Washington, Oregon, Vancouver area, is rising, and sea level actually is dropping there. But during the next earthquake, which can happen anytime, we expect up to two meters of subsidence in instantaneously happening along the coast. And as a result of that, large part of the coast would drop significantly and sea level would rise rapidly in a matter of um, uh, minutes, which has a um, significant consequence for the tsunami that would come in eventually. The other processes that drive the vertical land motion is the compaction of the aquifer system due to extraction of the groundwater or hydrocarbon, oil and gas. This process is uh, localized compared to the, compared to the tectonic um, uh, process that I discussed in the previous slide, but the rate can be a lot faster and, uh, in, uh, and changes a lot faster in time. And um, that's uh, often driven by the human involvement. So it's anthropogenic mostly. Um, the other process that is also uh, impacting the vertical land motion is the uh, glacial isostatic adjustments. Um, 
which is uh, due to the you know removal of the old the, the latest ice sheet that we had in North America, land is rebounding and rising at the location of the ice sheet, but in the perimeter of that land is falling to conserve the mass. So we expect about one centimeter per year of uplift at the location of that old glacier. But in the perimeter of that, for example, mostly along the east coast of United States, we expect about one to two millimeters of the subsidence happening, and it's ongoing. So the, 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 the characteristic of the GI effect is that it's usually linear in time, except in the places that are losing ice right now, like Alaska or Greenland. Otherwise, in most other places, GI effect in time is linear. So it's um, fairly straightforward to, to simulate and model that. We have another effect, which is the compaction of the sediment, uh, which is also a very interesting process, nonlinear, but also can contribute significant amount of substance along the coast. And that also can be manipulated by human. You know, we build dams and levees and we starve, for example, the coastal areas from sediment so the land would not rise. And suddenly we decide to remove the dam and then we have a large supply of the sediments and that would change the substance rate, rate and also aggregation rates, aggregation, aggregation, aggregating rates of the uh, coastal lands. And uh, that also impact the relative sea level rise. So it is a slide that summarizes all the effects, comparing them with the rate of the sea level rise, which is here. So horizontal axis is the rate, and the vertical axis is the time scale that they are impacting uh, the elevation or subsidence. So and here you see the sea level rise, current rates, and also projection. So under different warming scenarios. We expect to have up to a centimeter of the, um, up to 10 millimeter of the uh, sea level rise in some places by end of this century, which is quite a actually fast rate. Um, the processes that are to the right of this red line are processes that are more important in terms of rates than sea level rise in the time scale of a century. And anything that is to the left side are less important within 21st century, but may become important over the next um, two centuries. So looking at this map, fluid extraction and sediment compaction seem to play the biggest role in driving the coastal land subsidence within um, this century compared to the rate of the sea level rise. So to study coastal sea level rise, we have some uh, coastal uh, subsidence and relative sea level rise, we have some challenges. So we need observations that are extend, expen, expensive in the space, tens of to hundreds of kilometer, but also we need high resolution, tens of meters. And also we need observations that are related to the global reference frame to be able to compare them with the sea level rise. So this challenge provides us opportunity to bring two communities together, to community work with the GNSS or GPS and community that works with radar. The combination of the two data set provide us with the uh, observation that addresses those challenges, as I'll show you in the next few slides. So first of all, some take home messages. So the land, land subsidence exacerbate the hazard and risk associated with the sea level rise. Several natural anthropogenic factors drive the land subsidence. And also INSAR and GNS, GNSS combination enable measuring the contemporary rate of the land subsidence. First example from uh, coast of California, which is about 1,300 kilometers. Um, what you see here in the slide is all the available data. The frames are the footprint of the satellite images, different satellite we use, Sentinel, Ascending and Descending, and ALOS. Triangles are location of the GPS, GNSS stations. Red lines are the location of the faults, and so on. So we combine data from 2007 to 2019 to resolve the vertical land motion along this. So this is the mathematical framework. It's a unified least square approach that combines GNSS and um, inside observation. So to, to resolve for the 3D displacement field, and um, we have a um, um, weight matrix that associates, uh, assigned to each observation one uncertainty or one weight per se, and weight is the proportionally uh, related to the inverse of the um, uh, variance of each observation. 
So I jump to the results. So what you see here is the vertical land motion along the California coast. Blue is subsidence and red is uplift. So you can see there are long, long wavelength subsidence and uplift along the coast. And um, there are some localized uplift signal you can see here if you can follow the mouse. Here is the Santa Clara. This is the Livermore aquifer or basin. And this is the Santa Ana. All of these uplift are associated with re recharge of the aquifer system uh, in a post rut period. So after 2015 and 16, uh, uh, due to the reduction in pumping and also um, uh, pumping, uh, injecting and uh, recharging. Actually, they, are, they have injection and also natural uh, recharge of the aquifers. And as a result, the land is rebounding. So most of the subsidence in the south and also center part of the uh, California is associated with the compaction of the sediments. Um, uh, one of, some of them are landfills and some of them are natural uh, sediments. The uplift that you see here in, in the middle is um, likely to be associated with the, um, some of the uh, uh, reverse faults that we have in the region. And the uplift in the north is due to the uh, Cascadia subduction zone. So we compare this observation with the independent GNSS data that we didn't use in our analysis. So each circle shows two values. So the rim is the in soil measurement and the field color is the GNSS. If you cannot distinguish between the rim and the field color it means that we did a great job. And in the cases that, uh, for example, here, you can see there's a difference between rim color and also field color. It means that there is a discrepancy between the two observations. But in most cases, these are discrepancies because GNSS didn't cover the same observation period. When we compare uh, INSAR and GNSS for the period that they were overlapping, we uh, retrieve a um, um, standard deviation for the, their difference, which is less than one millimeter per year. Using that observation, we can estimate the population exposure to land subsidence. So we see that uh, here are communities that are color coded to their average population that is exposed to subsidence rate faster than one millimeter per year. So you can see that there are many areas that we have population exposed to subsidence uh, larger than half a million, mostly in San Francisco Bay Area, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Again, I emphasize um, expo being exposed to subsidence does not mean being exposed to flooding. Nevertheless, subsidence has other consequences, which is uh, impacting infrastructures, damaging foundations, railroad, and so on which is uh, something that has to be uh, accounted when we develop a management plan. Some take home messages. So we combine INSAR and GNSS to create the first large scale map of the vertical land motion along the California coast. So many of the highly populated region uh, are affected by subsidence. We estimate about 4.3 to 8.7 million people are affected by subsidence or exposed to it. And SAR data, with global coverage are publicly available. And we demonstrated that technology is feasible to process this data and create large scale maps. And uh, we need really, the next step is really is to use all this data technology and create these maps in a global scale. And for that really we need um, 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 support from um, agencies, funding agencies, government and also local authorities. And, academic units. I'll carry on, I'll move on to the next application, which is the East Coast of United States. This is a very recent study. Uh, we just submitted the manuscript of that. So East Coast of United States experiences increased in flooding um, hazard. Uh, over the past several years, number of flooding event has increased significantly in the region. And the, the area, the, Atlantic coast of the United States, it's home to many densely populated cities, lots of infrastructures, <clears throat> many important um, um, uh, uh, facilities, such as you know, the, one of the largest US naval is located along the East Coast. But also a uh, majority of the United States wetlands are located in something about 19 million acres of wetlands are located along the East Coast of the United States. They are valued at $360 billion 
dollars. And there is a long lasting debate. What is the vulnerability of these wetlands to relative sea level rise? So we, we thought the tools that we have is the best, um, Applica uh, best application of that would be to study this kind of uh, problem. So we did similar thing. So we collected all the data sets from multiple satellites, GNSS, and we combined them together to create a seamless map of the vertical land motion along the coast of the United States. As you can see here, majority of the East Coast is subsiding. Some areas subside faster, specifically here in Chesapeake Bay and also South Carolina and Georgia. I have the fastest rate of up to six millimeter per year. There are a few places that you see blue, which is the uplift or land is rising here. Those are associated with recharge of the aquifers that temporarily causes the land to rise. But again, comparison with independent GNSS data shows that uh, over this almost 3000 kilometer, we have a precision of about 1.2 millimeter per year for the difference between the two data sets. So we are very confident that our analysis is robust and results are reliable. So now we want to study the wetlands. So in the wetland community, those that work on wetlands, um, they always separate um, um, low laying from the high laying wetlands. And low and high laying wetlands are determined using this equation. So Z, if, if, if Z is the absolute elevation of the wetland, which we, we have very good map data set for that, thanks to the NOAA and USGS created a, one of the best um, LIDAR DEM for the wetlands along the US coast. So this elevation minus mean sea level divided by this ratio, which is the difference between mean height water minus the, and the mean sea level. So this would give us a factor Z MHW and this factor determines whether the wetland is high laying or low laying. If the Z star is larger than one, the wetland is categorized at the high, la high laying or high elevation. And if it's less than one, considered to be low laying or low elevation. And um, the expert in that domain believe high laying wetlands are uh, acting different than low laying wetlands. So, uh, in other words, the hypothesis that low laying wetlands have the higher chance of surviving the sea level rise, which is kind of counterintuitive for me at least at the beginning. But the argument is that low laying wetlands have the higher chance to get flooded. As a result, they get more of the sediment supply, while the high laying uh, wetlands have a less of chance to get flooded. So as a result, they have less of chance to survive the sea level rise. And there is a parameter called vert vertical resilience which is the difference between the vertical land motion rate and sea level rise rate. So wetlands aggrade if the VR is larger than 0 0.5, the submerge if the rate of the VR is less than 0 0.5 millimeter per year, and they maintain their status if the value is between minus 0 0.5 to plus 0 0.5. So we use all these data sets to estimate VR for all the wetlands. And here is the result. And you know, we, we try to do a rigorous job. So always we bring in error and uncertainties. So we did our estimation in 95% confidence range. So what I show you here is the vertical vulnerability of the, uh, or resilience of the wetlands in 99% confidence range. And what you see is the lower bound of that. And given that lower bounds, we estimate that almost 67% of the low uh, elevation wetlands are going to be are in danger at risk, while 72% of the high elevation wetland, which is already interesting observation, suggests that indeed low laying or low elevation wetlands seem to be slightly more resilient. But the picture is really dark and uh, dismal when we look at the upper band of that 99% confidence ring. If we account for that, which is a possibility, obviously, all the wetland, no matter how high or low they are, are, are at risk of being submerged and uh, vanishing in this century. So this observation is um, extremely you know, uh, important given the value that wetlands has, have to ecosystem, to the communities, and, um, uh, and uh, uh, 
and climate. Of course, wetlands sequester lots of CO2 as well. So that's part of that. So some take home messages again. First high resolution map of the VLM in global reference frame was created for the Atlantic uh, coast of United States. We estimate rate of as high as five millimeter per year for some cities like Charleston, Brunswick, and Chesapeake Bay. And we estimate at 99% confidence range, something between six, seven to 100% of low elevation wetlands are vulnerable to sea level rise and something about 72% to 100% of the high elevation wetlands are going to be vulnerable to the sea level rise. So I'm going to change the gear, talk a little bit about the index seismicity. So if there is any question about the previous section, you can ask now or keep it for the last, whichever uh, you like. So, in the seismicity, seismicity has become a thing, at least for the past two decades. This is an example from Oklahoma shows how rapidly seismicity increased there since um, middle of the, since almost 2005. So here we, I show you the observation of the, you know, seismicity plus location of the wells within Oklahoma. So most of you should be familiar with that or at least heard about this in news. So I would uh, skip over. I just want to emphasize, we are talking about the earthquakes that are caused by this process in disposing the wastewater in the deep layer, Arbuckle sometimes, specifically in Oklahoma that we do have Arbuckle layer, which is right above the basement. And we don't at the moment talk about the earthquake caused by fracking. So, you know, why we should care about the Indus seismicity. So Indus seismicity, some people argue that's a seasonal problem. So it was, you know, it was exciting to work on it for the past one or two decades and it's tapering off. And I have a slightly different opinion. So I think Indus seismicity provide opportunity, you know, to do basic science. So, you know, study seismic and aseismic faulting process in nature and investigate hydrological properties of the medium. This is something that's always of interest. So, and you know, natural gas production from tide shell is a key to energy independence, specifically in this uh, era that we have um, uncertainty due to the energy supply, due to war, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, natural gas, because it's cleaner, much cleaner than coal energy, for example, might be considered a short-term solution to climate change. You know, until we produce green energy for everybody, we need to provide energy somehow, so maybe natural gas is a good alternative. So I see a view that at least part of the natural uh, climate change solution to climate change in short term. So, and we have plenty of evidence to, to link injection to seismicity and that uh, uh, in contrast to natural earthquake that's very difficult to forecast them. I think induced earthquake can be forecasted and most importantly, CO2 sequestration via injection and also you know, enhanced geothermal power, uh, geo enhanced geothermal energy production will be accompanied by induced seismicity. In fact, you know, DOE roundtable recognized induced seismicity, the biggest obstacle to expansion of the CO2 sequestration in a uh, you know, populated area and, and also expansion of the enhanced uh, geothermal uh, energy. So by learning about Indus seismicity and the process, we can help really to produce clean energy in a safe environment and avoid creating earthquakes that uh, you know, causes panic at very least. So factors controlling injection are many, and I can add another two dozen to this list. <coughs> Just I'm listing some of them, you know, injection volume, fluid density, injection depths, what is the environment that we are injecting, the hydrology and diffusivity of the medium, fault geometry, background stress, magnetic frequency distribution of the background seismicity, and many more. So these are just a bunch to, to name, um, control the process of induced earthquake. So we created um, a process, a physics-based framework to link um, process of uh, fluid injection to eventually um, induced earthquake hazard and probability. So we created physics-based model that links wastewater injection to perturbation of the stress field. And then we create, uh, we benefit from existing 
a physics-based model to link the perturbation of the stress field to seismicity rate change. And then we explore um, uh, probabilistic models to link that uh, seismicity rate change into change in the probability of earthquake. So I show you an example from Oklahoma. We have a bunch of other studies published in recent years, but uh, probably the Oklahoma case is the most representative one. So we have lots of injection wells here. Each yellow line represents the, the depths, location and depths of the injection well. We are injecting more, more or less in the Arbuckle mostly. We have the access to injection volumes and uh, we created uh, the proelastic model. is a coupled proelastic model that uh, links change in um, pore fluid pressure and stress in the medium to the injected volume. And through that, we, create, we calculate proelastic stresses and pore fluid pressure change in the medium as well as the location of the faults. Then we um, uh, invoke this rate of state friction law following the Dietrich 1994. It's recently updated in um, 2018 um, and uh, I think 2019, but the, the, the concept is the same as the one published by Dietrich 1994. And in fact, the efficiency hasn't changed. And uh, this relation, this, this, rates, uh, uh, this rate and state friction uh, law based earthquake um, um, uh, seismicity, a uh, seismicity rate model uh, links change in the stresses uh, tau zero to change in the seismicity rate. And uh, by that, by doing that, we can calculate how seismicity rate evolves compared to the background uh, rate as a result of the injection. And then we can explore, um, uh, assume, for example, a Poissonian process for the earthquake nucleation. And we can use uh, this simple uh, probabilistic model to link the um, uh, change in the um, uh, rate of the seismicity to change in the probability. Uh, for that, we need obviously the knowledge of the background seismicity, specifically K and B are very important. B is the slope of the gutenberg richter law. Most of you are more familiar than me probably. <laughs> and K is the annual rate of the earthquake with magnitude larger than zero in the region. And S zero is the area. So we implemented that to the uh, or study area. So first we focused on the central Oklahoma. So blue curve shows the change in the pore fluid pressure and the red is changing the seismicity rate compared to the background. And we see due to this pore fluid pressure change in central Oklahoma for the period of 1995 through 2017 or 15 that we simulated that actually 17 we have very little change in the seismicity. Same calculation for the proelastic stress result in almost negligible change in seismicity. But combination of the proelastic and pore pressure, bam, it creates much larger change in the seismicity rate, which is very interesting and indicates the nonlinear relationship of between the seismicity rate change and the stress uh, rate change. Same thing for the western part of the Oklahoma, and we see that uh, quite a bit of uh, seismicity can be created or rate must be, uh, can change significantly as a result of the change in the pore fluid pressure and proelastic stresses. So here is the comparison of the observation and model. So first column shows the observation for the central and western Oklahoma. The red curve is the earthquake count density. The black line is just a histogram and the blue is the magnitude uh, time distribution of the earthquakes. So we try to simulate this observation using only pore, pore pressure. We see that the agreement is um, okay, but we don't have a quite a good agreement. But when we include both effect of the pore fluid pressure and the uh, proelastic stresses, we obtain um, a very good agreement, last column and first column if you compare them, between the earthquake count, but also earthquake magnitudes are also uh, simulated. So we can get also earthquakes that are large enough to be compared with observations. So we have some challenges in future workings. You know, how does the pathway of fractured and, uh, fractures and faults linking Arbuckle to basement? So we don't know that injection happens in Arbuckle, earthquake happen in basement, how they are linked. So that's a still open question. How to account for the interaction between indus seismic and a seismic event. So 
recent observation shows that quite a bit of actually the sleep that is triggered by uh, injection is aseismic. And how that aseismic behavior interact with seismic behavior is a, um, a topic of active research. And then we need to also know uh, how mechanical properties of the medium are distributed. We have very little knowledge of them. Also background seismicity rate has to be known and also background stressing rates need to be known to create a um, effective earthquake um, uh, induced uh, earthquake uh, hazard model. Just uh, uh, to close, I have one or two, a few slides, maybe three slides on relationship, uh, how did surface deformation help us answering some of those challenges? So I show you here seismicity so rate as a function of diffusivity. So injection rate is the same. What I'm doing here is just I assign different diffusivity, which tells you how easy, how fast fluids migrate in the medium. By changing the diffusivity from one square meter per second to two meter square per second, the amount of seismicity rates drops significantly. This suggests that if you have a medium that fluid can flow easily, the chance of creating earthquake is a lot less than a medium that fluid has a hard time to flow, which is probably um, intuitive. Second uh, simulation is that we created, uh, we used the same injection volume in three medium with different diffusivity. So diffusivity changes from open five to two square meter per second. And then we simulated surface deformation. We've seen that for medium with the lowest diffusivity, surface deformation is the largest. So this suggests that surface deformation is also related to the diffusivity. So diffusivity play a key role in driving the seismicity, but also is related to the surface deformation. So if we, if we use surface deformation to resolve diffusivity, we can obtain a better estimate of the seismicity rate change in a logical sense. So we created a, an inverse um, um, a modeling um, scheme, as you can see it here. Uh, we took a site which is in the Western, uh, sorry, Eastern Texas, Timson, where we have four injection wells and we know exactly how much they are injecting at which layer. One of the two of the wells inject at the depths of about uh, 800 meters, and the other two to the west here are injecting at the depths of about 1.6 kilo, uh, kilometer. And then satellites collect the data over this area, and we can measure the surface deformation. So combining surface deformation injection and um, knowledge of the layering in the medium we can create an optimization framework that the output is the hydraulic diffusivity of the medium. And then that hydraulic diffusivity can be used to evaluate um, uh, change in a pore fluid pressure and stress and seismicity rate in the region due to the fluid injection. Here is the result. So the left shows the search space or misfit, misfit between observed surface deformation and simulated surface uh, deformation for a model that the only three parameters are two diffusivity, one for the shallow layer about 600 meters, uh, sorry, 800 meters. And the second one is for deeper layer at depths of 1.7 kilometers. And we can see that the values, um, that the surface deformation is extremely sensitive to diffusivity. And we can resolve the diffusivity for deep uh, for the shallow and deeper layer at this, these values, which are actually consistent with an imp in the independent data set that we have for the region, which was very um, um, interesting. My last take home message, the physics-based framework presented here explain overall frequency and magnitude distribution of the Indus earthquake. Pore pressure is always the primary driver of the seismicity, but pore elastic stress play a key role as well. And surface deformation can be used to constrain hydrological properties of the medium, which help with improved um, estimate of the seismicity rate and eventually seismic hazard. So the pro proposed framework can, put, can potentially be used for operational induced earthquake forecasting and developing smart injection plans. For that, I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any question you may have. Thank you, Dr. Sirazmi, for such an informative talk. So I would like to ask one question first. So uh, 
how do you differentiate between uh, that high subsidence and low subsidence level? So you are talking about the, the case of the Atlantic coast. Yes, yes. So in that case, we were not, the distinction was between the high elevation wetland and low elevation wetlands. Okay. So, and that's defined by the tide, with respect to the tidal heights for every location. So there is a study, if you were interested in learning in depth of Holmquist et al. 2021 and 2022, they created that data set for the entire coast of United States through, by comparing tide gauges with LIDAR data and other independent measurements and created this uh, mean sea level and mean high, uh, mean high water elevation for entire coast of United States, which we um, exploited in this study. Yeah, thank you. And other thing is like uh, you may saw in the last few last slide that uh, the diffusivity is kind of related. If higher diffusivity, lesser subsidence, and lesser diffusivity, higher uh, uplift. So, do you think along the coast is it related to that geology that or the uh, diffusivity of uh, the rock that is related to the subsidence that is observed? I, I, if I understood question, uh, your question, you are asking if diffusivity of the rock plays a role here. Yeah, along the eastern coast. Oh, oh okay. So um, interesting. For the eastern co east coast problem, uh, we did not really think about the porosity per se, but um, that's a very interesting question. You know, when when sediments are added, you know, when 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 sediments are transported to the coast, and they're added on top of the existing sediment. The first thing that happened, they, they compact the sediment underneath them. So the porosity reduces, okay? So land would land elevation at first would drop when you add sediment. And then there is a moment that um, porosity drops to a threshold that fluid escape slows down. So in this way, it's, it's near a steady state condition. So then addition of the new sediment causes the land elevation to rise. So, and when the land elevation rises on top of that, the added load on top of the sediment causes the pressure to increase inside the layers that are uh, below that. And that increased pressure at some point overcomes tensile strings of the sediment and fractures develop and you start a new phase of subsidence. This is um, less studied along the coast, but it's a very well known problem in, uh, you know, uh, uh, fracking, hydrothermal, uh, uh, sorry, the hydrocarbon exploitation, er, exploration, you know, they call it blowouts, sometimes one of the term. So, um, but in this study, we didn't really go that far. We just documented that and then we were happy with that. And, uh, but in future, we're gonna look at that process. We created model, actually, I created similar models for the West Coast of United States, San Francisco to explore, explore the same process that you, yeah. Thank you. Hi, manager. Very really nice talk. Uh, thank you for your time. I have a question regarding the Atlantic subsidence. So uh, we didn't see the plots, uh, but you might have some GPS uh, centers along with the that that has a um, uh, distribution along with that subsidence that. So does the GPS time series also show the similar subsidence velocity as you see from the INSA? Right, so that's a very good question. So, you know, for this study, for the validating GPS station or, or data with GPS station, we, we chose the GPS station very carefully. The point, the reason is that GPS has a, you know, pillar or monument, okay? That are sometimes, um, some of them, tens of meters under the surface to be on a, you know, on a bedrock or on the rock. But most of the subsidence that we see happen in the top few meters. So very That's often true. GPS station actually doesn't capture the, the subsidence rate well. So that's the case for wetlands. In fact, whenever you go to the wetlands area, GPS observations are of very little use to my that's experience. True. So INSAR is great and there is a, um, a more traditional or conventional tool called RSET, R-S-E-T, which is short for, uh, I can't remember. If you just put it in a Google, it will come. So it's 
uh, and that's a very simplistic tool to measure uh, substance of the um, uh, wetlands. And the result from that is very different, often very different from what GPS measures, just because GPS is anchored to the depths, which is several meters below the top layer that most of the action happens. Interesting. <coughs> Thank you. Any more questions? Uh, okay, so if there is no question, I can go for, although I have signed up for the one-to-one -one talk. Thank you so much, Sergi, for the good presentation. Uh, mm, my point is, so you have showed in one slide the relation between the different hazard uh, with its time, like how much intense it, it will be. Could you please go to, this, to the slide? Sure. I believe you are referring to yeah this one yeah yeah uh, so I mean uh, what, on what basis we are assuming that 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 fluid extraction is gonna be uh, the more harmful for the immediate or like for short term we need. Uh, the fluid extraction, we, we have to be much careful of the fluid extraction subsidence. Like mm -hmm. on what basis we are deciding that particular part is like- oh, this, this graph is a compilation of many studies. So tens, if not hundreds of studies that we collected in that review paper, if you check that. So it's a compilation of many studies. I put the number together and um, I created this data set. Okay. So this is a schematic. So, you know, for example, you find a study that has the fluid uh, deformation due to fluid extraction rate that is a lot slower than sea level rise as well, but majority are at that range. So it's just uh, like, like a median of the range that you would expect. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, are there any more questions or we can go for individual talk after uh, the seminar? Yeah, I hope like everyone have uh, signed up uh, for the seat on the seat. And thank you, Professor. Uh, so it's, thank you, Dr. Siraji for uh, attending our seminar and giving such a nice informative talk. Uh, sure. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity, everybody. Yeah, we'll have one individual uh, talk just after the uh, seminar. So uh, I think the first one is Christos. So uh, everyone can leave and Christos and Dr. Siraji will have a talk. Thank you, Dr. Siraji. Thank you. Hi guys. Uh, hi Manu, thank you for your talk. Thanks so much for the time. Appreciate that. How are you doing? I'm good. Yeah, we were watching your talk with a Iranian student actually in my lab. Hadi. <laughs> we have a new student here. So we had a meeting before the seminar and I kept him here to watch in the big TV. So ah. <laughs> um who else is here? Okay, so I have just one question, um, but I, you know, we usually try to encourage students to ask questions during the, after the seminar. So, you know, I didn't mm -hmm. wanna I intervene. First of all, I mean, congratulations 
for the wide range of applications you are showing us here. Um, that's really exceptional, I have to say. Oh, thank you, appreciate that. Very, very extensive and interesting work, <laughs> at least, you know, with what I have seen with Finsar. Uh, that's really great. Um, and uh, <coughs> the question I have was, when you are relating the um, you, are, you, are trying to, you are trying to, to, to make a discussion about uh, surface displacement and uh, diffusivity. Mm -hmm. It's interesting and makes sense. Um, well, first of all, what is the depth of the, of the phenomena you are talking right now? Like a couple of kilometers? Uh, the, uh, the example that I showed was um, two injection happened, two layers that are injection happening. One of them is about 800 meters. And the other one is 1.6 kilometers, so 800 and 1,600 meters. Right. So that's shallow. Okay. Well, Very shallow. Yeah. Um, because I was wondering if I mean, probably for such shallow layers, and I'm not an expert in hydrology. I'm just talking from the modeling, the formation point of view. You know. There is some factors that could affect the, the, the displacement you see at the surface that is not only diffusivity. I mean, if you, like, sure. you want to do the one-to-one -one, um, uh, relation, it probably it would, it's fine for the shallow part. But, you know, I was wondering, you know, how the medium deforms if you have different material properties, like, uh, you know, uh, you have an isotropy, but mostly, you know, softer, shallow layers compared to stiffer, deeper. Um, and I, I didn't ask, I, I want to ask if you have looked into that. Yes, because yes. So it, that's the area. Sorry, I tried to just quickly answer that. For that area, we have actually quite a bit of um, uh, measurements. You know, we have, we, we talked, we work with the uh, oil and gas industry in region. So they provided us with the good knowledge of, you know, shear modulus, poison ratios, and so on for medium. So we, we have a very constrained problem. You know, otherwise you're right. There is a trade-off between shear modulus and diffusivity. You can have a very small shear modulus or young modulus and then um, high diffusivity and then, uh, or low diffusivity and you get the same values, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we, we try to constrain every other parameter 